so what I thought I'd do today is start with an introduction to reinforcement learning because I think many people uh, are interested about it, but maybe haven't, uh, they, they've heard the results, but they haven't seen the foundations of RL. So I'll start with the foundations of RL, uh, the basic building blocks, and I'll, I'll sort of walk my way through to, towards uh, the more modern applications of reinforcement learning. Uh, and, and in the second half, I'm actually going to focus then on, on video games, and in particular, on the Atari 2600. Uh, so if you if you know everything about reinforcement learning, you can uh, you can zone out for the next 20 minutes or so, and then come back to us in 20 minutes. So let me start with uh, deep learning. Actually, uh, deep learning is uh, undoubtedly an AI success story. It's sort of taken the world by storm over the last uh, five years or so. Uh, with you know some of the coolest stuff out there is a style transfer, where you can transfer style from one painting to another image. Uh, or even just classifying the paper that sort of started the revolution, Alex Krzyzewski's paper saying you can actually really uh, classify images quite well, much better than anything else using a convolutional neural network. Uh, to some more exotic stuff, for example, doing analogies using word embeddings, uh, again using convolutional networks or maybe recurrent neural networks. Uh, and so there's been a lot of successes around deep learning. Um, and the question I want to ask today and that, uh, that I want to talk about is decision making. So deep learning is often about classification or matching or generating. And in reinforcement learning, what we're concerned about is the question of taking action based on inputs. So here's a few examples. Suppose you're at the restaurant uh, and you need to decide what you're going to eat. How do you make the decision? Uh, what influences that decision? Okay. Or maybe if you're actually controlling more important than ordering from an Indian menu, uh, what if you're controlling uh, a wind farm and you have to decide how to allocate uh, different power outputs, maybe allocate how these turbines are going to run, when they're going to run, how do you control for day and night cycles, uh, that kind of question. So more of a temporal aspect to it. Uh, what about if you have to actually uh, decide on which drugs or which treatments uh, a patient should go through. Again, there's a temporal aspect to these questions, and also now there's a, there's a life and death question. So these, these questions, decision-making can be, um, can have high, high impact. Okay, so actually, speaking of uh, clinical trials, uh, if you think of it in terms of uh, deep learning, right, or supervised learning, the, the, way, the way we would think about this is to say, we're going to start with uh, the patient's information, in deep learning terms, these would be features, right? The, the raw input. And we're going to plug in as an input the kind of drugs, for example, we would get, like to give to a patient. We're going to feed all of this to a big deep network uh, or a big classifier and ask this classifier to say, will this drug work well with this patient? Uh, and if you think about it, that's how most clinical trials also uh, you know, shaped and they're asking a question, does this drug work? What are the side effects? And, and trying to predict all the things about a single use of this drug. And now, this is going to give us a bunch of numbers, but what it doesn't tell us is how will the patient react to this drug if they've taken drugs in the past that are related or different? Uh, for example, you know, that, that warning on, uh, on Tylenol boxes telling you not to take anything, anything else that has acetaminophen in it if you've been taking acetaminophen already. Uh, so that's that idea that, that sequential decision making is actually important, not just one shot decision making, uh, is actually one of the foundations of reinforcement learning. And so just to give you an example, uh, this is work we did in 2007, actually before the deep learning revolution, um, and we were looking at a clinical study. And so just to give you a sense of how sequential decision making arises actually in clinical treatment. Let me, let me read this to you. Uh, this is an example of the kind of rules that you would have to invoke if you're dealing with the clinical treatment of a patient that has um, alcohol problems. And so the, the quote goes as follows, following graduation from an intensive outpatient program, alcohol dependent patients are provided naltrexone. And that's the first sort of the first input, right? In the ensuing two months, patients are monitored if at any time the patient experiences five or more heavy drinking days, a non-responder, then the medication is switched to acamprosate. If the patient reports no more than four heavy drinking days during the two-month period, a responder, then the patient is continued naltrexone and monitored monthly for signs of relapse. So how is this different from 
the one-shot case, where we're actually conditioning, we're choosing something, in this case, naltrexone, and then conditioned on how the patient responded to that first treatment, then we're going to make a second decision. And now the question is, how can we actually plan for the sequence of decisions to actually have maximal impact on the patient's health? And so, so the really cool thing is that the, 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 this idea has come um, uh, to, the, to the clinicians as well, who have actually started looking at sequential treatment in their clinical studies. So there, there was this one study we worked on during the course of this work uh, called the STARDI study. And the STARDI study was looking at major depressive disorder. And it was an, an NIH-funded study led by a team of clinicians in the U.S. And what they were trying to ask is, uh, people who have major depressive disorder often go through it. It's not something you can, you can cure in one treatment, but you actually have to look at it over periods of years, maybe decades. So how can we actually best treat these, uh, these people on a sequential basis and make long-term decisions that are actually going to affect them uh, well? And so just to give you a scale of the study, there was 4,000 patients. The study actually spanned seven years. Okay? Uh, and then there were 40 clinical sites across the United States that were involved in the study, there were four sequential treatment phases. So patients were started on one drug, and then, and then they were reassessed six to eight months later, and then they had a choice of different kinds of drugs, and again, this repeated this process for three more years. Uh, and in total, there were 13 different treatments that the patients could follow. Not the sequences, but the actual treatments, right? Um, so that's, that's more like the picture of sequential decision-making that, that I'm going to care about. And that's the picture that I think matters when you're doing clinical um, treatment of patients where the impact ha is on, on the order of years. And so for that kind of problem, we, can, we could use uh, the one-shot approach, except that now we would have to treat every possible sequence of decisions as an individual input to the network, right? And that would be quite costly if you have 13 treatments and you have four stages, then you have um, 13 to the four possible sequences. If you have 14, 400 patients, you're not going to have enough data to be able to assess all of these uh, outcomes. Um, and as a matter of fact, actually, this was one of the bottlenecks of this, treat of this study, is even though it was such a big study, 4,000 patients were still a very small number uh, when it came to evaluating all these possible sequences. So we did some work with this, and, and we actually applied reinforcement learning techniques, and uh, we found you could actually sort of reliably tell the patient, you should start in this drug, and it's going to depend, we're going to, we're going to give you that drug, not just for that time step, because that would maximize your, your, your success rate right now, but also taking into account longer-term dependencies. And so in this, this graph from the paper um, is showing that we can give if the, the, the x-axis is the patient's um, score, it's called a quids score, and it's indicating how, uh, how, heavy, how heavily are you affected by a major de uh, depressive disorder. So six is the lowest that would be allowed in the trial. If you're below six, you don't really belong to the trial. And 26 was the highest they were considering. And then on the y-axis, you have the slope. So it actually, it was the first action, and one of the features was to look at the resulting effect of that treatment on you. Um, so the way to interpret this graph is to say, let's look at what your score was and how well you reacted to this treatment, and based on this, we'll assign to you a second treatment, uh, looking at the, the outcome of this, and also taking into account these longer term dependencies. So you have three, you have four shaded regions corresponding to f three different choices. And what's very interesting is that there's a clear separation that if a patient, for example, was, had a low quid score, which means uh, MDD was not, uh, was not affecting them too badly, then maybe they would continue with the same drug, which is a uh, citalopram, CIT, and only go with cognitive therapy, which is sort of a lighter, basically there's no additional drugs being added. But then if the patients actually had a higher quid score, then we would decide to, to, to augment their current citalopram drugs with something else. And we would look at different features of the patients to do that. Okay? So that's, that's it for the introduction. And at this point, maybe we can be asking the question, well, what's reinforcement learning? What, what do we mean by that? And so I want to give a quote from Richard Sutton, uh, which basically says, reinforcement learning uh, can be thought of this way. It's, it's to say, all goals and purposes 
can be thought as a maximization of some value function. And what I'm going to show you is, is actually what that value function term means. Uh, but that's what reinforcement learning is going to mean in the context of this talk, maximizing a value function. So the usual way to think about reinforcement learning, remember now we have these sequential interactions between, uh, between the system and an environment, is actually we're going to talk about the environment is at the bottom, in this case it's the earth, and then we have an agent, and the agent is at the top, the brain, uh, the agent chooses actions, basically hands them to the environment. And then the environment in response to these actions is going to return a state and a reward. Telling the agent the outcome of you taking this action from the state you were in now led you to a new state. And here's the reward that was associated with this state. So let's, let's start looking at these actual different components. So the first component is the reward function. And the reward function, I'm going to write R of STAT. ST is the state, AT is the action. So that reward function, it's not a supervised learning signal. It's just telling us what the outcome, what the desired outcome is for a given state. Okay, so for example, if you think about the game of chess, uh, if you're playing the white side and you checkmate your opponent, then we could say, well, here, when you reach that situation, you have a reward of plus one because you win the game. Uh, on the other hand, if your opponent checkmates you, then you get a reward of minus one or a penalty because you failed, I mean, you lost the game, right? Uh, and maybe if there's a stalemate, then we would have a reward of zero. Actually, in this context, we're always going to have a reward of zero. In, in this particular setting of chess, we always have a reward of zero, except uh, when we reach an endpoint of the game, plus one for winning, minus one for losing. So that's why this is different from supervised learning, because in supervised learning, we would associate a label with every state along the way. Whereas here, we have something that's very, very sparse. We're only told if we won or lost. Okay. So we have a reward function. Uh, the second piece that we need is to talk about a policy. And a policy, I'm going to write pi of st, is a mapping from states to actions. So that's the, that's the agent side. The agent has a policy. Okay, and so that policy basically says, for each possible state, I'm going to tell you which action to take. And it's going to indicate an action that should be taken. So for example, uh, maybe from the start state in chess, E4, moving the pawn forward, the king pawn forward, that would be our policy for that state. But maybe in a more complicated situation, for example, that middle game, which is a game that Bobby Fischer played in 1956, uh, that was called the game of the century, then the best action is to move the knight to that A4 square, okay? Um, and, and that game is called the game of the century because very famously, the board looks like a mess and then Bobby Fischer found this, this fantastic sacrifice which only is really a sacrifice and, and pays off for black about 10 moves in. And so from, from, a, from the get-go, if you just look at this position, you might not realize that this, this position actually matters. Um, so the, the point I want to make here is that actually the policy is a mapping from state to actions. So if you change a single piece in that board, if you play chess now, you'll know that's true. If you change a single piece in that board, then the policy should also change or could change. Okay, so for example, if we move, uh, there's a single piece that's different between the two, the two chess boards on the right. Uh, if you move that bishop one square, the white light square bishop here, then at that point, uh, this is no longer the game of the century. This is just a regular game, and maybe your policy should be different. Okay. All right. So now let's try to define what this notion of value function is that Rich Sutton was talking about. And the first attempt we're going to say is, well, since we have this reward function that we're trying to maximize somehow, maybe we should maximize the sum of rewards. Okay. So the value function v pi of st, let's call it to be the sum of rewards. Uh, and, and it's going to be along the trajectory that we follow with this policy. Okay? So we start in the first, posi first position in chess, and we follow through the game playing move by move, and our opponent answers with each move. And then the value of a state is not the immediate reward, but the sum of the rewards of the state. Okay? Which means all the states that lead to a win would have a value of 1 in this case. And maybe now if we played a different kind of move, that we would end up in a different state, from that state, maybe we lose the game, and so the value is going to be minus 1 instead of 1. Okay, 
except that doesn't quite work. And the reason why it doesn't work is because it, it doesn't quite capture uh, the richness of the environments we would like to care about. For example, suppose I'm still playing chess, and I'm going to move my bishop out uh, on that square, and now the opponent isn't quite deterministic. The opponent is actually going to choose one of the two actions, move out one of the two knights, with 50% probability. So the previous definition doesn't encode this because I'm actually just looking at a sequence of states. So what we're going to have to talk about now is a transition function that tells us, given that I choose an action, what is the probability that I end up in a new state? Okay. If you think about, for example, sequential treatment uh, in, in a clinical setting, then this kind of, this kind of stochasticity is useful to, to model the fact that you don't quite know how the patient is going to react whether it's because there's external factors you haven't taken into account or, or simply that, you know, that, that there's, there's randomness out there, whatever, whatever way you want to see it, uh, the patient's outcome, the patient's response to a drug won't be a deterministic function of, of their state. So the transition function is P of ST plus 1, given ST and AT, and it's just going to encode the, how we move from state to state in this world. Um, now, very important in reinforcement learning, we usually think of these transition functions as being Markov or Markovian, which, um, which, which basically means that it doesn't matter how we got to the state ST. All that matters is starting in the state ST, we're going to assign a, a probability to transitioning to the next state. So we, don't, we can actually discard the previous history. Uh, in the case of chess, it doesn't matter how we got to a position. Our playing only depends on the state we're in right now. So the second attempt that we're going to make at defining a value function is to incorporate this notion of stochasticity, of randomness. Um, and I, I've written this very succinctly here, but basically what we're going to say is now, instead of just talking about the sum of the rewards along a trajectory, we're going to add expectations, right? So weighting every option by its probability, we're going to add expectations that we choose a transition, um, or rather we, we choose a sequence of actions and then we observe this stochastic sequence of transitions that is given to us by the environment. Um, so now I've actually, I've actually allowed us to also have a stochastic policy, which means that instead of the policy telling us, I start in a state and I always do the same thing, then I'm also allowing myself to choose my action randomly, but using some sort of fixed probability scheme. So we can talk about things like this, and we're actually very close to the right notion of value function. But we're not quite there yet. And so if you look, if you look at this chess diagram, uh, where white is in dire trouble, black can checkmate at least two ways. Uh, but black can checkmate by moving the rook to the very end of the file. Okay? And that would cause an, in, uh, an immediate win for black. Or, because black is in such good position, black could also move the king one square to the left. Then white can't really do anything, so white is just going to move around. And then move the rook and checkmate again. Okay? And if you've ever played chess with somebody you don't like, maybe you've done this just to, to, to make them hate themselves a bit longer. <laughs> so if you do this to Gary Kasparov, he's going to be very angry. Um, so we would like to capture this in our notion of value function that we actually want to end the game as soon as possible. Okay. And so the third attempt, and, and it's going to work for today, is going to be to add a discount factor to our value function. The discount factor is with gamma, and it, it's between 0 and 1, and we're not allowing it to be 1. Okay. And now what we're going to do is to say the value of a given state ST is going to be the sum of rewards that we look at into the future, except future rewards are discounted exponentially. So the reward of time, uh, in this case, uh, i time steps in the future, will be discounted by, um, by gamma to the power i, with the first reward being completely undiscounted. So the reason why this matters is because now we can look at our two chess positions, and on one hand, we have a value of 1 for immediately checkmating the opponent, and in the other case, we have a value of gamma because we're actually delaying the game by one move. And this is going to matter because what we'd like to do is to talk about uh, favoring the short term over the longer term. If we have two equal options in terms of summer rewards, we'd like to get there faster. There's actually no a number of other reasons to prefer uh, discount factors be below one, but this is, this is going to do for today. 
Okay, so, so what's the point of reinforcement learning? It's to maximize some value function. And now we're in a position to actually say what that, what that value function is and what we're going to do. So we're going to look for a policy, pi star, which maximizes over all possible policies, v pi, the value for that policy. Okay? And then so if we have an optimal policy, then we have an optimal value function, which we're going to write v star. And that optimal value function will then tell us what is the expected sum of returns, sum of rewards, sorry, expected discounted sum of rewards under that policy. If you think about the case of chess, that would be, in a way, the expected uh, gamma to the power of number of steps that you would expect to take to win. Or if you think about uh, clinical treatments, then that would be maybe the expected outcome of the patient, but discounted by this, uh, this factor, so we want to, the, the patient to actually get better faster. Okay, so how can we actually find this optimal policy? And this is where reinforcement learning comes in and says, let's develop algorithms to, to really get this optimal policy as fast as possible. So I'm going to talk about three of them. The first one is policy iteration. Uh, then I'll talk very briefly about value iteration and finally Q-learning. So the idea of policy iteration is probably the simplest idea in reinforcement learning. And that's what we used in, uh, in the study when analyzing the data from the study trial is we're going to start with some initial policy. Okay. Then we're going to evaluate this policy, asking the question, what is the value at every state for every action we take for that policy? That's computing v pi. And then, given that current evaluation, we'll do what's called a policy improvement step. Well, we take our evaluation, and then we locally look for the best move uh, at each step. So let's look at what that means. Well, first of all, to do policy evaluation, what that means is we need to somehow go out in the world and find out what the value of a state is. Okay, so the value of a state is the expectation uh, both under the transition function and the policy of the sum of discounted returns, uh, rewards. And it's very important that the value function uh, is always for state, right? So we're saying we're going to start in state S0, uh, corresponding to S, and then we're going to go from there and look at the value. Okay. So what this looks like is, if you, if you look at this diagrammatically, then the value function for S would be we start in this early position, and then we traverse a whole game of chess, move by move. Okay. And what we're saying is the value of this, of this uh, state is the sum of the rewards we encounter along the way. Okay. So in the game of chess, the rewards are zero, so it's going to be just the one at the end. But in general, we might have other rewards along the way. And now what we can do is we can do what's called a Monte Carlo update, where we're going to look at exactly one instantiation of that expectation, the sum of the rewards, and we're going to average them. And so it looks like this. So we're going to say, we're going to evaluate our policy by playing many, many games of chess, and then averaging the resulting value for that state. So we, you can think of it as a for loop. We're going to loop over all the states. Um, and then for each state, play out the policy and then average the outcomes. And that might sound really dumb right now, but actually, uh, people have used this, for example, to evaluate backend in positions or evaluate go positions. So this was actually one of the uh, key components in uh, and playing Go over the last, for example, 10 years, I think, um, where the, the, the algorithm, UCT, would look down and do some searching in the tree, but at some point would say, I'm not going to search any longer, I'm just going to play randomly, and I'm going to evaluate the, evaluate the value of my current Go, Go board based on random rollouts, and I'm going to average a lot of them to get a good estimate of the value of that state. And that turns out to be a really powerful idea, as long as the policy that you have is actually decent. Okay, so we can do Monte Carlo policy evaluation, and that works quite fine, except we can do better. We can do better in the sense that we know that a transition function is Markov, right? So what does that mean? It means that the state uh, distribution only depends on the state we started in and the action we took. So when we're looking at this whole trajectory, we're, we're, we're really ignoring the fact that all of these individual transitions were independent, and we could have dealt with them differently. 
Okay. So the insight of the, the uh, this insight here is to say rather than try to learn using Monte Carlo rollouts, we could directly use this Markov property to write down the value function more succinctly. And this is probably one of the fundamental equations of reinforcement learning is as follows. The value function for state is going to be the expected reward starting in that state plus the discounted next state value. So notice here how we've actually taken out the rest of the trajectory. We're just saying we look at an immediate reward and the next state. And as long as we had a good, in, we had a good guess as to what the value of that successor state was, then we could just use that equation and never have to worry about long rollouts. And so this is, this is Bellman's equation, uh, this version for policy iteration. Okay? And we can use this now to estimate the value function. So one thing we could do is we could start with some sort of estimate, uh, vi of the value function. And now we're going to sample a bunch of transitions. But now notice each of these transitions is independent. So we're no longer looking at whole trajectories. We start in a state and we sample a transition. Okay. And then, and then we average these out and we get a uh, policy evaluation using the Bellman equation. And if we repeat this process, then, then we would have, again, we would have vpi. Um, OK. There's another way to look about uh, this equation, and this is maybe one you're familiar with. It's called TD learning. So, so far, I've been talking about these equations and averaging samples. And maybe that feels very unintuitive. So another idea that came actually that predates many of these policy evaluation ideas and in, in, in its, its, its concept is TD learning, temporal difference learning. And the idea of temporal difference learning is to say, we're actually going to update based on a single transition. So we're always going to be updating. Instead of doing these averages and these iterations, we'll just keep averaging. Um, so the idea is you sample an action from your policy. Then you receive the reward from the environment. The environment picks the next state using the transition function. Okay. And then you're going to move your value function a fraction of the way towards uh, the reward plus the discounted next state value. Okay. And this, 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 um, this term between parentheses is called the temporal difference error, the TD error. And this is sort of a signal telling you how much of your prediction about the future reward is given your current estimate. And what's really important here is that actually you're making a guess using a guess. Your V of S prime is your estimate of the value function. And your V of S is also another estimate. Okay? So you might, ask, you might ask the question here, well, why can I bootstrap a guess from a guess? Why does that even work? It turns out, uh, and this is one of the fundamental results of reinforcement learning, that this completely online process where there's no averaging, there's no iterations, that is still going to converge to V pi. And in practice, we're actually going to favor methods like this just because they're faster. OK? Um, and so once we have, once we have our, our value function, then we're going to do policy improvement. And so let me actually change the notation just a tiny bit here. And we've been talking about V of S, the value of a state. We can also talk about Q of S, or we call Q values. And the Q value is the same value as before, but we're going to fix the action. So we're asking the question, if I take this action from this state, what is going to be the resulting sum of discounted rewards? Okay, and we can write the same Bellman equation that we wrote before, where we say Q pi of SA is going to be the reward plus the discounted expected next value. Okay. The reason for writing it this way is because if we actually have Q values instead of V values, we can do what's called policy improvement, where we compute all of our Q values. Then to compute the next policy, we'll just take the argmax over our Q values. The argmax is the one that maximizes the value under the current policy. Okay. So just to think about this in other terms, we start with a guess, a guess policy. Then we evaluate this policy, knowing how well we do at each action for that policy, given that we follow, we take an action, then we follow that policy from, from there on. And now if we locally choose the best action, it turns out this process converges. And this process is going to converge to the optimal policy. Okay. So policy iteration has two steps. First, you evaluate, then you improve. And then you evaluate, then you improve again. Um, so it's natural to ask the question whether we can do better, whether we can do both at once. And it turns out you can. 
So you can write down this equation, which says the Q value is going to be the Q value. Oh, this should be a reward. Um, apologies. So we could, we could do this, this maximization process instead of waiting for the policy to have converged. Let's do this maximization process on the fly. We look at the Q current guess for the Q function, okay? And we pick the maximum action in the next time step. Okay. And it turns out, so this is Bellman's equation for, for, the, for the optimal case. And it turns out that uh, this also converges to the optimal value function. Okay. And then if we have the optimal value function, then we can recover the optimal policy by just choosing the action which has maximal value. So again, there's TD learning, which is the online version of this. And then there's Q learning, which is the, again, the online version, but now we take, we take the max. So instead of following our policy along, we're going to always be greedy with respect to our own guess of what would be best. Okay. And what's fascinating is if you do Q learning, uh, then you're actually going to converge to the optimal policy. So answering the question, how do we get a hold of that optimal policy? Well, we can do Q learning. And if you think about many of the recent successes, that's what's been used because that's a very simple algorithm to implement. We basically have our current Q function, and then we have our TDA, which is now involves a max instead of an expectation of the policy. And then we're done. And we just apply this and apply this until we converge. So sort of summarizing the the basics of reinforcement learning, we have, we have two major cases. We have evaluation, where we're trying to learn about the value of a fixed policy. For example, uh, what is the expected outcome if I fixed this treatment for a patient? And we have the control case, where we're actually asking the question, how do I get the optimal treatment? How do I get the optimal policy? Okay. And I've sort of hinted at this so far. There's actually two, two approaches to doing this. There's the online approach where we're going to apply an algorithm at every step trying to improve a bit uh, our value function. And there's the model-based approach where we're actually going to try to, to do these big sweeps over the data and then and use our, our knowledge of the environment to evaluate uh, and get an up, a better policy. Okay, so... Just to sort of recap, the, the building blocks of RL is we have this transition function uh, and a reward and a policy, okay? And we use those three elements to, to construct what's called a value function, discounted value function. Okay, and then the discounted value function is, uh, is the main tool that we're going to use to learn about values and policies, okay? And then we have a number of algorithms for either evaluating or uh, finding the optimal policy control. So what's really cool about RL is you can actually apply this in a number of contexts. So it's been applied, for example, to, well, tic-tac-toe. That's maybe not so surprising, but it's also, you know, been applied to chess. Um, it's been applied to Go, of course. All right. And now the question is, well, we can play all these games, but can we actually use reinforcement learning to do something like flying a rocket? Uh, or can we, can we use reinforcement learning to make sense of, um, from, a maze from Harry Potter? Or, you know, is this kind of tool going to scale to, to something the size of Times Square and, and make sense of the interactions involved here? And at this point, one of the things you should be asking is, well, you've defined everything in terms of a state. And if you think about chess, for example, there's, we know there's so many positions, we can't actually enumerate all of them and, you know, do anything sensible with, these, with the set of state uh, in finite time. So clearly, I'm, I'm still hiding something. And uh, the answer is, in practice, nothing is as simple as I just described it. OK, so we have, we have the Q learning is going to converge to the optimal policy. So it's going to give us the optimal answer. But once we add an approximation to the mix, for example, if we have a deep network telling us what the value of a state should be, then that's no longer guaranteed. So we no longer can, get, can guarantee that Q-learning is actually going to give us the optimal policy. It's actually worse, we can get divergence. So we can get, uh, very famously, somebody showed this in the, 90s, in the 90s, you can get a network whose values are going to get further and further away from the actual value. And this is very distressing. Okay. So one big, 
result in, in what our Atari games was actually um, managing to engineer a system where Q learning works. Okay. Um, and this is just sort of just talking about learning the value function. Now, if we actually have to go out and discover the world, so what we call exploration, then we don't even know how to do this uh, optimally. We, we, even in a tabular case where we have discrete states and actions, we still don't know how to go out and explore the world. Okay. Um, and so one thing I want to talk about is actually I introduced both this idea of Monte Carlo policy evaluation and, and temporal difference learning. It turns out that we don't even have, uh, well, we have an answer, but it's not even so clear which one we should use. And let me show you why. So when we think about Monte Carlo sampling or Monte Carlo rollouts, we're going to look at a whole trajectory and then update the value function based on the trajectory. And the trade-off here is that we're going to have what's called low bias in our estimate if we now average a bunch of trajectories because it's actually a, an unbiased estimate of the value function in the policy evaluation case. Or we'll have high variance. And the way to realize this is that um, if your game of chess lasts 100 moves and you're making a stochastic decision at every step, then the number of possibilities is huge. And so if even just half of these games lead to a win or a loss, then you can see now why you're going to have to look at a number of, of, of possibilities before you even get a good estimate of your value function. On the other hand, if you look at a temporal difference learning idea, it's exactly the other way around. It has low variance because we look at a single transition, but it turns out it actually has high bias because we're bootstrapping a guess from a guess. So Monte Carlo has no guessing, it just actually looks at the outcome. And TD learning has high bias because it's, it could be completely wrong at the next step, okay? So one algorithm that's out there um, that tries to get um, away from this problem is the idea of, discount, of, of lambda return um, and the idea of mixing in different lengths of rollout. So TD learning, you can think of it as a one-step rollout where I just look at the next state, look at the resulting reward, and then do my update. I could also look at two steps and then do my update and, and use the sum of the rewards up to there as my Monte Carlo rollout. I could do this for three steps or I could do this for t steps. Now, if we, if we average all of these together in a very specific way, then we get the TD Lambda algorithm. All right, so the TD Lambda algorithm is, is written like this. It's basically going to say, let's look at the value function and we're going to add not the, re not the rewards, but the discounted weighted sum of TD errors. And the way to think about this is exactly what's on the previous slide. This is mixing in the very long Monte Carlo returns with the very short TD backups. And what's really cool is you can show that there's this Goldilocks point in the lambda parameter that actually achieves the best performance. And so this was a classical study by, again, by Rich Sutton, uh, showing that the best lambda is roughly around 0.8 for many, many interesting tasks. That's not necessarily true in general, but it's clear if you do Monte Carlo, you get huge variance and that costs you something. And if you just do TD, then you also have a huge cost. All right, so what's interesting now is this is, this is for the policy evaluation setting. If you throw a max in there, we're no longer in the policy evaluation setting, we're now in the control setting where we're looking for the optimal policy. Okay? So what that means is we're now asking the question, I'm going to take an action, but disregard what my policy actually does, and instead look at what I would have done under the maximum value. Now imagine you play a random game of chess, where you're still going to do your updates as if you had played the best move according to your Q function at every step. Okay. So it turns out that you can't necessarily guarantee convergence in this setting if you try to do the lambda trick. Okay. So in policy evaluation, TD converges and TD lambda converges, and so does Monte Carlo um, estimation. But if we look at the control case, we're trying to find the optimal policy. That's no longer the case. Q learning converges, but off policy Monte Carlo doesn't converge. 
And, oh. and basically, the idea is that control is a special case of what's called off-policy learning. And let me give you an example to see why this matters. Suppose that you're this robot, and you're trying to navigate the underground to get to South Kensington. Okay? And so you go to King's Cross. I don't know if this is actually the optimal path, but this robot will go this way. So the robot goes to King's Cross and then from there to South Kensington. And we're going to call this pi the policy that we would like to evaluate. But suppose that a robot, instead of going by the Piccadilly line, actually goes uh, by the district line. And the mu then would be the behavior policy. And now we're asking the question, can you learn about the value of pi if you're only ever going by this alternate route? And of course the answer is no, because if you never see the right data, then you're never going to be able to estimate the value of pi. So the only thing you can do is estimate the value of mu, right? And so it turns out that it's not too hard to show that off-policy Monte Carlo or control Monte Carlo doesn't work because it's going to give you the wrong value. So it's going to say, yes, it's, you know, the value of, of going this way is, is v mu, where mu is the behavior policy. Okay? And the issue is that the expectation is under the wrong policy. So now there's this algorithm from, again, from the 90s called Watkins Q Lambda. And Watkins Q Lambda says, sure, you're allowed to go whichever way you want. Go by the behavior policy mu if you want to, but as soon as you diverge from pi, I'm going to stop you. I'm going to stop this lambda weighting that we had before, and I'm going to force you to do a one step back up like TD learning, like Q learning, because we know Q learning converges, right? So that should work. Now, what's funny is that this algorithm was proposed in the 90s, but it was only this year that we managed to prove that it actually converges to V pi. Okay? Uh, but that's actually a really cool algorithm. So it's saying you can be off policy, you can do whatever you want, as long as you cut, as you cut off what we call the eligibility to traces, the discounted lambdas, the right way. Uh, so, so this is some of our recent work where we basically looked at this form of the, of the equation where we have the same thing as before, where we have the sum of discounted TD errors, okay? Except now we're going to introduce uh, a product term, the product of CIs. And these CIs are going to be our correction terms. So one thing you might know is important sampling. When we do important sampling, we draw data from a distribution mu, but then we want to evaluate another distribution pi. And the easiest way to do this is we multiply by pi over mu, right? So if you remember, the, the expectation is basically multiplying this whole equation by mu ai, given si. So doing important sampling means we're going to recover the right policy. The problem with important sampling, as everybody knows, is the variance um, is through the roof. So actually, in, in 2000, there was an algorithm that was proposed called tree backup, which, which got very close to getting the result we have, but not quite. And tree backup says, let's multiply the trace by the probability that we would have taken an action under this uh, policy. What that means is in the tube case, we would have multiplied the trace by zero the moment we went off the expected path, because pi in this case would be zero for the action we didn't take. Okay. Um, so our new algorithm is called retrace lambda, and effectively, it's sort of combining the two. It's saying, let's do important sampling, but let's truncate to make sure we don't have variance. And it turns out that that's all we need to, to show that Watkins Q lambda works, and it's also all we need to get really good performance um, on a number of domains. Maybe this is not super exciting because it's mostly theoretical assumptions, uh, but it's all to say, it's a non-trivial result to actually get this thing, uh, to even show that this thing converges in practice. So uh, you, you, need, you need to have something called the increasingly greedy property. Uh, you need to have non-negative coefficients, and you even need this strange assumption that things must asymptotically commute. And I'll leave it at that. Um, I'll just show you sort of a, res a result curve. So this is us evaluating uh, retrace, this, this lambda algorithm, on a set of Atari games. And I'll talk more about the Atari games in the second half, but just uh, think of it as 60 different games, and we're trying to play all these different games with the same algorithm. And what we're comparing here is, is the performance of these algorithms normalized between 0 and 1, okay, in function of lambda. 
And what you're going to see here is that you have Q learning at the bottom, which always does this one step back up. And we know this is convergent in the tabular case. Um, and Q learning is basically dominated by retrace for the same Goldilocks reason that I was showing you earlier. Okay. Now, what's really cool is if you actually look at the tree backup algorithm that was proposed 16 years ago, you see the same kind of effect. It works, but we can actually still do better. And then there's another algorithm called Q star. And Q star is the one that basically doesn't do any corrections. It does exactly TD lambda for the control case. That's the case I told you is wrong and doesn't work. And it turns out uh, we had a result actually showing that Q star will work if lambda is small enough or will fail catastrophically if lambda is big. And that's what you're seeing here. If you make lambda too big and you start looking at trajectories you never take according to pi, then everything fails. So then we, just, we, just, we basically said, well, you have Q star, which is not safe, and we have tree backup, which is not efficient, um, and in this retrace algorithm, which includes Watkins Q lambda as a special case, that thing is safe and efficient. Okay, so that's the end of the first half now. The take-home message here is that RL is very different from supervised learning, uh, and discovering the optimal policy is more than just minimizing a lost function. Uh, but what's good about reinforcement learning is that the potential impact is quite huge because we can now start actually asking questions such as if I gave a patient this drug in stage one and then uh, they went on to stage two with certain probability and then they went on to stage three with a different kind of probability, how would I best, uh, how would I best decide which drug to give them in, this, in the circumstances? Uh, so in this end, I think this is, this is the, the first half. And, uh, if you're curious for more, the second half we'll be talking about video games and some of our applications of reinforcement learning to video games. All right, thank you very much. Please. I have a question. Please ask the question. So earlier you had this overview slide with model-based methods, and I was wondering what this, what what it means, or what kind of model do you want? Where does it come from? Um, what kind of assumptions do you make? So that's a very good question. I think. One case where we would have a model is, for example, if we're, if we're learning to play Go, where the model is, where well, there's two parts to a model in this case, there would be the opponent, and there would be the actual transition of the environment, which in this case is just moving from one board position to the next board position. So sometimes the model is given to us, like in the case of Go, uh, maybe the opponent, we decide we're going to be doing self-play, and then that gives us a whole transition. Uh, so in that case, that, that's easy because we can actually draw these samples from the model. In other cases, we don't actually have the model, uh, and I'll actually give a, a, an example of that in, in, this, in, this, period, in this half. Uh, and if we don't have the model, then we can actually either learn the model or, or maybe put model-like assumptions on the value function, and I think that's a completely open area of research, where, to, where the model comes from. Okay, well, thank you very much for the question. So in the second half, I'm actually going to move away from the math and, and uh, show more of the applications of reinforcement learning, in particular to uh, video games and in particular to the Atari 2600. So I want to start with another quote. Uh, this is the talk full of quotes by Rich Sutton. Um, this was in a, in a video lecture, actually in a, in a, in a talk uh, at the... Um, symposium on reinforcement learning at ICML in 2009. Uh, the, the video lecture is actually online. It's Jerry Tesoro, who, who is the person who designed TD Gammon, which was the, the world champion at Backgammon, which was trained with reinforcement learning. Okay. So Jerry Tesoro was giving a talk called 50 Years of Reinforcement Learning in Games. And it's online. I highly encourage you to go watch it because it's very, very enlightening. And at the very end of the talk, if you don't make it through the whole talk, at the very end of the talk, somebody asked the question, why is AI research wasting so much time, and we could add so much money, on games? And, and, then, and then Rich 
had this answer where he said, well, in practice, games end up being more real than anything we try to make up. And this is the theme of this second half, is to basically argue that even though games don't really reflect the real social questions, at the end of the day, they're the best research platform we have. Okay. So if you look back in history of AI, even going back to 1956 to Samuel's Checkers player, uh, we see this. We see the, the usefulness of games in AI research. Uh, if you're not familiar with Samuel Strecker, I'll actually mention this a bit more. I'll talk about this a bit more just now. Samuel was looking at uh, showing off the IBM computers and showing them off by showing you could train a program to play checkers. And this was in 1956. And what's really cool about this is if you go read the paper by Samuel that came out in 1962 describing all the research they did, there's actually a point where and effectively what he's saying is I tried to train my learning algorithm from whole trajectories and it didn't work. And it sort of translate, I tried to do off policy Monte Carlo and it didn't work. And so I wish I could go back in time and say, you just have the wrong algorithm, let's fix this now, right? Uh, so Samuel was actually looking at this question of reinforcement learning 60 years ago, which is pretty cool. And so I'm just going to jump in time and you know, you, we can look at the backgammon successes, TD Gammon, uh, there was checkers, at Checkers, we had a world champion at Checkers in 1994. This is a team from the University of Alberta where I did my PhD. Uh, and then uh, there was the Deep Blue success where Kasparov was crushed by, by Deep Blue. Uh, and then Checkers now is actually solved, so we know exactly the optimal play for any position from Jeff Checkers. Uh, and 2014, uh, heads up limit, uh, Texas Hold'em was, was solved, and two players. Uh, and then, of course, there's the, the, the goal result, which is the most recent, the most exciting. Um, so all this to say, it's clear that if you look at AI research, we care a lot about games, and we're very successful at designing good solutions for these games. So what I want to sort of say is that all of these games are classical games, but I think the argument applies just as well to video games. Okay? And so if we look back just even at text adventure games, I don't know how many of you have played these adventure games, but you know, you're, you're just basically it's telling you you're in a cave with 20 rooms and three tunnels, and invariably involves bats and monsters. Uh, but this is a completely text game, but I think you know, people have actually used this as an AI platform, and there's, there's a lot of interesting stuff to, to do with these games. So you can think about Zelda, uh, or maybe Neverwinter Nights, uh, or Civilization, right? Or, or even um, actually, sort of homebrew uh, games. So all of these games, except maybe for Zelda, have been used for AI research. And one of them, the GVGII, I'm not actually directly involved, but I think it's a really cool project. It's the general video game AI competition, and it's, it's held every year, um, and it involves uh, testing agents in a suite of 20 uh, games um, designed to sort of challenge AI. It was, it was actually built on top, or, or sort of as a response to the arcade learning environment, which is my own project. So the arcade learning environment was my PhD thesis, where we proposed the use of Atari 2600 games uh, for evaluating AI and general AI. Okay. So if you've never seen an entire game, this is a game called Pitfall. And in Pitfall, you're this, uh, this guy here, Pitfall Harry, uh, and you're navigating through a maze of rooms, uh, basically dodging these logs, jumping over pits, Everything is sort of out to kill you, and you're trying to find you're trying to find rewards. Um, so this is probably the hardest part of the game. You have to jump over these crocodiles, and I'll just let it play a bit longer to show you something really important about this game. So I don't know if you've noticed so far, but all I'm doing is navigating through the space. At the top left, you have the score, and the score just keeps going down because every time I hit something, I lose some points. I also have some lives. I've, I've become very good at avoiding things and not dying in this game. Uh, but other than that, there's no reward. And this, this is the first reward. Uh, so this is the kind of tasks we think are challenging for AI agents, the kind of task where the reward is actually five or 10 minutes away from the beginning position. OK, so, so the Atari actually, I, I said it was my PhD project, but it actually got spurred by a paper from 2008 by Carlos Duke, who was then at Rutgers. And Carlos Duke basically looked at this very simple domain, Pitfall, but a single room of Pitfall. And he said, how can we get this guy to navigate as fast as possible to the other end? 
And what he did is said, well, look, we have this Atari game and it's really complex. And if we were to deal with it from pixels, it would be really, really hard to do that. But if we knew where the objects were, then we could uh, do some uh, inference and actually learn a better value function. So the point of the paper was actually to show you could define a value function in terms of objects. And uh, using these objects and reason about the world and explore the world in a much more efficient fashion. And so just to put things in context, this was 2008, the whole environment was starting on the left and going to the right and leaving the room. That was, that was the scope of that project. And the reason why this is still daunting, or this was daunting in 2008, is because uh, if you look at an Atari screen, you have 210 pixels on, in height and 160 pixels in width. The screen actually gets stretched double, which is why it looks the way it does. And you're getting 60 frames per second. Right? So remember in the first half we were talking about states and we're saying, oh, I'm going to evaluate the value of this particular state. Well, now it turns out even if you just think about every single frame as being a different state, right? Uh, that's going to leave you with a lot of different states to think about. So clearly the, the tabular case, the simple case where we count states isn't going to work. Okay, so basically that's the, that's the idea of the second half is to say, it's great, the, the first half is great if you're willing to wait forever. Otherwise, you need to do something more, okay? Uh, we can't visit all the states uh, answering the questions. Often, we don't even know what the reward function or transition function is. If we have an agent playing pitfall for the first time, that agent doesn't know that there's a reward seven screens away, okay? And sometimes, we don't even know what a state is. For example, in the case of pitfall, uh, the state includes my lives, my score, my position on the screen, which screen I'm on. It also includes what I've actually picked up, that gold bar at the end. And once I leave that screen, I won't have that information anymore. So that should also be part of my state, sort of as a memory. Okay? Uh, so the, the Archive Learning Environment, the ALE, was actually created uh, to challenge these methods. And so as I said, it started with Carlos Duke, um, and then there's actually this reinforcement learning workshop in Barbados, uh, where, where my PG supervisor, Michael Bowling, had this idea. He said, wouldn't it be great if we had agents that played all Atari games, right? Uh, and in this one, and he had a master's student work on this for a little while, uh, but it was sort of, I came around and then packaged the environment into usable form, uh, did some research, which I'm going to be talking about today, um, and then this, this led to a release of a platform. If you haven't used the ALE, but you, you're curious about artificial intelligence, you want to do some research, I want to really encourage you to look at it. It should be fairly easy to use now. Uh, it's open source, it's freely available, uh, feel free to email me afterwards for details. So we released this around the end of my PhD, uh, and this was used. And of course, what you should certainly have heard about was the fantastic phenomenal success we had at DeepMind, where we took deep networks and feeding them the raw screens uh, could learn the same value functions I was talking about earlier. Okay, and then since then, the the the, the uses of the Atari in research have sort of exploded. Uh, there's been a lot of different uses since. Okay. So what I'm going to do now is actually cover a few of the um, uses of the Archive Learning Environment in research, uh, a few things I've done with it, both from a straight reinforcement learning perspective and also looking at different questions that are related to reinforcement learning. So the first one I want to talk about is this notion of contingency awareness. And at a time um, sort of spurred on by, by Carlos Duke's work on Pitfall, we thought, well, could we look at these frames and try to decide where the objects are? That's a really hard question. So maybe what we could ask instead is, what do we control on the screen? And what don't we control? Okay. So what does that mean? Well, let's look at the game uh, like this one. This is a game called Sequest. And in Sequest, you're uh, a yellow submarine, and you're, you're moving in this sea space. And you have two tasks. You have to prevent the fish from getting to you, and you have to collect these swimmers that are in blue. And then, when you get six swimmers, which you can see because it's blinking, then you can't collect any more swimmers, you can go to the top for extra points. And now, of course, like in many of these games, there's a timer, so if you run out of oxygen, then, uh, then too bad for you. Uh, and then the game continues, and most of the Atari games were designed in an arcade fashion. If you sort of do something, then you move on to the next level, which is harder. In this case, the fish are yellow, and they're going to move faster, and they're going to be meaner. Okay? 
So, so, so what's neat about Sequest is if you look at it, if you think about it in terms of objects, there's some very clear objects and object interactions in this game. Okay, so you have the submarine, and you have the submarine shooting, okay, and you have different fish with different colors, but they're all effectively the same fish. And then you have swimmers, and the swimmers have different interactions from the rest of the stuff. Um, and of course, if you collide with a the fish, then bad things are going to happen. So now you might wonder, all right, well, this is good. Uh, this isn't too hard of a game to play. Uh, so your agent should be able to play this game quite easily as well. So one thing I did during my PhD is I would actually, when I, when I had friends over, I would ask them to sit down and play some Atari games for me, just like a reinforcement learning agent would. What that means, I would sit them down and say, you have the arrow keys in the space bar, and I'm not going to tell you anything else about this environment. And so this is one of my friends playing the Sequest for the first time. And you'll see, uh, it's quite interesting what she does. So first of all, she's sort of trying out the actions. What happens if I go left? What happens if I go right? And now she sort of presses fire. And, and there's a sense of confusion, right, compared to, to the previous video. And then she's, she's looking at this. I think I remember that she was looking at this, the swimmer saying, well, what does that mean? What are they trying to do? Are they, are they attacking me? Right? And then she's going to run into things, trying to guess at what happens when she actually just runs into things. And it's fascinating to me that I think we forget when we, when we play games that we've played for a very long time, we forget that actually humans, when they come to something new, also exhibit the same kind of behavior that we often see in our agents. And there you go. That's the first playthrough. Game over. Okay. So the idea that we had back then was to say, clearly interactions between objects is an important concept in Atari games. Um, and in particular, in, in nearly all of these games, there's, there's some notion of self, which we call the avatar. If we can identify the avatar, then we could start asking questions like, uh, well, where which objects can I interact with, okay? And so what, the goal of this project was to decide where the avatar was, what it was, what the avatar was, based on this idea of contingency, so what, uh, what the player controls, okay? And the reason for this, I've hinted about this, uh, this before, but the reason for this is because just detecting objects, um, even, even in Atari, this idea of spontaneous object detection uh, is still something that we're struggling with. And now, I'm sure many of you in the audience will tell me that's not true. Uh, so please, please do go ahead and, and show me that it's not true afterwards. Um, but at the time of the release, and I know also from a deep learning perspective, this wanting to first detect the objects and then do something with them later, um, that's posed a lot of problems if we want to do this in a game-independent fashion, right? So not just for a single domain, but actually doing this across 60 games. Uh, so one thing that, that Yavar Nadav, the master's student, did is he looked at, for example, a game like Freeway and said, I'm going to ex detect the background, subtract the background. Okay? Now, this leaves me with just a foreground. Uh, and now, based on this, I'm going to um, extract some blobs, merge the blobs, and label each of these blobs as an object. So in this case, maybe in the case of the game Freeway, I don't know how well you can see it at the top, you're a chicken uh, on the left, and you're trying to cross the road as chickens would. And then there's a bunch of cars going, trying to stop you from crossing the road. Um, and so he said, well, there's two classes of objects here, cars and chickens. And we're going to basically label these and then build a representation. This was before deep learning. Uh, build a representation that encodes the position of the chicken with respect to these cars. Now, one thing that could go wrong is there might be a different number of cars at different times in the game. The same thing with sequest. There could be different numbers of swimmers, different numbers of fish. Does it matter if there's two fish? Is it a different kind of state? All these questions sort of come up. And as a matter of fact, one thing we did is we, we evaluated this, this approach called DISCO, uh, detecting instances of classes of objects. We evaluated it in comparison with other approaches, and it was terrible. And so it worked really well in a few games, like Freeway, and actually for sequest has been too bad. But it turns out that detecting objects in a sort of domain independent fashion was really, really hard. And that's, that's something we, we struggled with. Which is why we thought looking at contingency awareness would be easier. So 
So the idea of the, of the paper was to say, let's look at a state or a screen. And based on the screen, let's try out all the possible actions that we could do from that state. Suppose we have a reset, because the, the emulator allows you to reset to a given state. So we're allowed to do this. Let's reset to the state, and now um, let's, let's query all the actions. And this is going to give us, in the, in the case of the Atari, just 18 different actions. Basically, the x-axis, the y-axis, and the fire button. And you can do diagonals, so that's nine, nine positions in the fire button. Let's try out all the actions, and then, um, and then look at which pixels actually change depending on the action we chose. And some pixels aren't going to change. For example, the blue background shouldn't change based on my action. Right? So if you do this, you end up with this overlay, this white overlay here, which is saying these are the pixels which change uh, immediately when I take my action. So these are the pixels that we're going to control. These, these is, this is the region of control, the immediate re region of control that I have. So you can see here, there's actually, of course, around a submarine. Um, the bullet, it turns out in Sequest, once you fire the bullet, if you go up, the bullet also follows you. So you see this in the region of control. Okay. The fish might disappear or might not disappear, depending on where you shoot it. Uh, and the score. So at the very top also, if you hit the fish, then you'll get 100 points. If you don't hit the fish, you don't get any points. And there's actually a fish appearing here. And it turns out the fish appearing depends on your action. And so there's a single, there's a single pixel here saying that. So what we did is we took these raw frames, built a supervised learning data set of these frames, and now it's just a classification problem. We're going to take every single pixel, actually we took five by five blocks of pixels, and then use logistic regression, or you could, you could use a deep, ne deep network, to predict which pixels are under our control. Okay, and we do this, and then we get, uh, we get the following afterwards. So if you look at Sequest, what you'll see now, this is the actual model predicting what's under our control. And it's pretty neat. It's basically saying, yes, I, you know, that region around the submarine, that's under our control. Um, there's the X, the, 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 the red X, the red cross, rather, is the center of mass of that blob. Okay, so this was Sequest. This is a different game called Ice Hockey. And what's really cool in Ice Hockey is you have two players, and the, the, the model actually knows when you switch players. It actually knows this based on the shape of the, of the player. Okay, and then there were other games, like this, this is a game called Asterix, where you're trying to collect stuff. And it didn't work so well in Asterix, but still enough to, to, to sort of detect, um, again, the center of mass uh, is on the avatar. And that's actually what we're going to use to detect where the avatar is. Okay. So if we apply this to Sequest, we basically, again, this was pre-deep learning, so we made everything into tiles. We chop up the screen into 10 by 10, a 10 by 10 grid. And now we're going to encode the position of the avatar within the 10 by 10 grid. Okay. And, and what you'll see is this is basically what we get. It's, it's pretty dead on, right? We exactly know where this avatar is. And I want to emphasize that here, this is from raw pixels, right? So we're actually classifying uh, what we control and then using that information to decide where the avatar is. So this was pretty neat. Uh, now, what we did with this is we then encoded the presence or absence of colors uh, in the screen after subtracting the background. And this is the kind of feature that the agent will see. And this is the basic, this is before the position, we just encode these values. And now what we can do is we can actually take this encoding of the screen and describe the shifted representation where we shift based on the avatar's position. So we're basically going to construct an egocentric representation for this agent to use. Um, with the AD in mind of using the avatar position in this case to, to just play Atari games better. And so this is what the represent this is what the agent is going to see basically. And you'll see that one thing that arises when you do background subtraction is very funny things like this is the oxygen bar, and we had to decide on a mean value for the background. It turns out that mean value is sort of roughly in the middle. And so everything to the right is white, and everything to the left is orange where it's depleted. And that's just the kind of woes of having to deal with background subtraction. Okay. Um, so the really cool thing is that this was, this was five years ago. We're still wrangling a bit with the Atari, but already we could show that using contingency awareness, we could really get some better results. Um, and, and we show this across 60 games. Um, now, this was, the training times are quite short, maybe 5 million frames. 
So in comparison, we're using you know, 200 million frames right now, so 40, 40 is much data. And we're getting better results. Yes, Mark? So if I understand this correctly, the, let's say, the art behind this, uh, the results here is finding a really good representation that allows you Yes, yes that, that's a good, that's a good uh, description of, uh, that's right. So in this case, we were using, I should specify, that's right, we we're using SARSA, which is like Q-learning, but on policy. So we're trying to, it's like, like TD Lamb, more like TD0. Um, and then the goal here was to discover a notion of state. Well, we don't actually have a notion of state. And so we're trying to come up with the best thing that's going to generalize across Atari, Atari frames. Yes, very good question. Are there, yes, at the back? Um, are there any games in Atari where the agent isn't kind of given an embodied avatar? That's a very good question. Yes, there's plenty of game, and as a matter of fact, we did terrible at these games. <laughs> uh, so that's actually why the Atari is such a great platform for research, because you can get good results in 50 games, and if you're failing on the last 10, then you have a choice. You can declare success or you can say, no, no, I actually need something that's, that's even better. Any more questions? Yes. Um, well, I could name many games. Uh, I guess one, for this particular case, um, one of the game that is um, where well, there's no avatar was a game called uh, Battle Tank, where you have a 3D, a 3D field of view, something really, really primitive, but it's still a 3D field of view. So it's a completely egocentric representation. So if you already have an egocentric representation, then this approach doesn't help because there's, no, there's nothing to control. Um, now, there's other games where we do have an avatar, but we were failing for other reasons. Uh, like Montezuma's Revenge, and I'll actually talk about this one in, in, in a bit later. Any more questions? Yes. Okay. May, uh, maybe I'm not understanding uh, completely the math, but uh, so maybe my, my question is stupid, I don't know. Uh, how do you recover? So, so that's, a good, that's a very good question. So in this case, we didn't actually find the objects. We, we have one object. The only object we have is the position of the player. So it's not even an object, we're just saying there's a point. We're going to define the position to be that point. Now think of this as we have a hundred possibilities for where this object could be. We've, we've discretized this into a hundred positions. And now, and now we're going to use this encoding to encode the colors in the screen. And the way to think about this is we just take the cross product of the two. So we're going to build a giant table. This is, going to go, this is going to give us a big binary vector where every entry says, is there a color of a certain type at that location? Um, things have evolved since then, and this, is, this, is, this was fairly primitive, right? Um, but this was an encoding, a binary encoding of all the colors on the screen with the, with the background being subtracted. And then what we do is we, we make 100 copies of this vector, and we we basically zero out all the copy except for the one corresponding to the position, position we're in. So it's a very crude way to encode position information in a, uh, in a relative way. I, yes, Andras? Actually, here then you, you have an object detector, right? Because different objects have very distinct colors. So So you're saying we didn't do a good job at the object detection and we should have just done something different. It's true that in many Atari games, I think we're very good as, human, at human, as humans at finding these objects. But it turns out there's a lot of corner cases that end up being tricky. So the shapes change over time. Sometimes they're occluded. Like, for example, the submarine here is the same submarine, but it's half the submarine. So I think you're right that if you just look at contiguous blobs of color, that's going to get you somewhere. But then there's, in, in other games, I'm going to try to find Pitfall here. You know, this is a single object, but it's actually four colors. So 
these simple rules get you part of the way, but they don't actually work the whole way. Is there any way to deal with like kind of fishing right into a submarine when we are actually occupying the same square because of discretization? Actually... That's also a very good question. So the answer is, um, I think the best our agent could do is know that there's a fish very close by. And if that's the case, then run away. Um, but we couldn't do better than that. And then this is why a better, maybe a neural network would do better because it actually could learn the boundary between the fish and the submarine in, in, a, in a cleaner way. More questions? In discovering the object that you can actually control, are you assuming that uh, you see the reaction immediately? So, do you mean in the learning process or in the... Discovering what you can control, you were talking about that, right? If, um, so, you, you, you take the action. Yes. And, uh, you expect to see the changes immediately or you allow... Ah, I see. So, the way we defined it was a very simple way. We said we're just going to look at the one-step change. So, if, for example, you press the fire button and then something happened five times step later, we would not be able to record this. Uh, that's actually that would have actually been a way to extend the work we did, but we just started with the, the, the one-step version. Um, one nice side effect of looking at the one-step version is typically the things you can change within one step are the things that directly pertain to you as the embodied avatar. And so it, it, it emphasizes on things around, around the avatar, whereas if, if we look at multiple steps, then there's a point, for example, if you look at 10 steps ahead and say how many pixels can influence 10 steps, 10 steps ahead, that's a much broader area. Um, but that's a very good question whether we could use this information. Okay. So the second thing I want to talk about is some work that we did uh, two years after that. And it's very related to the question that Mark was asking earlier, which is can we learn this transition function? So if we don't have a model, can we still think about doing reinforcement learning with a model-based model? I'm not actually going to talk about doing RL, but I'll show you uh, that we can learn a transition function to some extent. So what does that mean to learn a transition function in Atari? Well, it means we're going to start, again, the simplest case with a single frame, and we want to make predictions about what's going to happen in the next time step based on the action we choose. So if I'm sitting at this crocodile and I go wait, then I should predict that the next frame, next frame looks very much the same. On the other hand, if I went jump, then maybe I should predict that the character actually jumps uh, towards the next crocodile. Okay? And so what we'd like to do with a method like that is we'd like it to be fast, we'd like to learn this model fairly quickly, and we'd like it to be accurate. Effectively, we want the, we want the best model out there. Okay? So the, the most simple way to deal with this uh, is to think about predicting every pixel separately. Um, and the way we do this is, for example, we're going to look at the previous image, the previous frame. And for every pixel in the frame, we're going to make a probabilistic prediction about what that color should look like at the next time step, based on a local neighborhood. Okay? We're going to do this for the pixel on the guy's head, we're going to do this for the pixel on the crocodile, for all these pixels, and we're going to condition this on the action, and then we're going to com combine this frame. Okay? Now, the problem with this approach is if you do this, you actually end up with a lot of noise. So one thing you could do instead is you could say, all right, well, maybe what I should do instead is learn to predict uh, whole patches. Okay? And so this is also something we looked at. You could say, I'm going to take a big patch of image, and because it's Atari, the patches don't change too much, so I'm going to make a probabilistic prediction about which patch it's going to be next. Okay? And then uh, combine this to an action, and, and again, sort of piece all of these patches together into the next frame. So what are we building here? We're building a model of frame-to-frame -frame transitions, which gives us a kind of transition function. Okay. So in this paper, what we were looking at, we were actually looking at combining patches of different sizes. Because the idea is that if you look, for example, in the top right corner, that big patch of background 
is never going to change. So we'd like to make a single prediction about this one big patch. But on the other hand, the stuff that's happening around the agent uh, and the crocodiles, that's going to change at a very fine grain resolution. So we'd like to be able to deal with this as well. Okay. So what we did here, uh, without going into too much detail, is we had multiple levels of Bayesian model averaging, where we basically start with a single frame, and we say, should we break up this frame into four quadrants? And then we do this recursively. Okay. And so we recurse, recurse down to the pixel level, and then for each, wherever we stop, whether it's a patch or a pixel, we're going to now make a prediction, like I, like I said, a probabilistic prediction about that pixel or that patch. Okay. So let me show you uh, what that variable resolution looks like. This is a game, um, this is a game called Pong. And what you're seeing here is actually the very first frame that the model is generating, and that frame is completely crazy because the model has never seen any data. Okay, what you're going to see is uh, the, f the predictions that the model is actually making, um, and overlaid on top of that, the, the, the variable resolution that the agent is learning. So on the on the right hand side, you have the agent's paddle. Maybe I should pause this for a second. Can I pause this? No. On the right hand side, you have the paddle that the agent is controlling. On the left-hand side, you have the computer paddle, and then you have the ball in the middle. And in Pong, Pong is one of the simplest games out there. You just have to score points against your opponent. Uh, and you have the score at the top indicated with a zero for each player right now. So what you're going to see is that this variable resolution model is going to start by looking at big patches. In this case, we sort of forced it to use patches of at most 32 by 32 pixels. And then as it collects evidence that it should actually use a finer discretization, it's going to refine its, its partition. Okay, and so this looks like this. So you see where do we need fine resolution, where, where the ball is and where the panels are. And for example, that very big patch at the very top, uh, that never changes. So we're just going to use a single patch to predict this. And what's nice about the model like this is that um, it's much faster because now to make a single prediction for the top right is much faster than predicting every single pixel separately. So we actually worked on these models long enough that we could get them to play about 20,000 um, 20, frames per, uh, per second, which is actually um, about three or four times faster than the emulator itself. So we had a model that was faster than the emulator, which is always pleasant. Um, and so you can see now what's happening is that the more we play, of course, uh, the model is learning, this is using Bayesian model averaging, so the model is learning that on average, it's better off learning fine resolutions because that always leads to better predictions. And it's happening faster and faster where the paddle is actually moving. You'll notice that at the back where the ball never happens, then we're still using big patches. So that's, that's fine, and if we use that kind of model, uh, we get the following kind of result. So at the very beginning, again, maybe I'll explain what this game is. Uh, this is a game called Freeway. I've mentioned Freeway before. You're the chicken. You're trying to cross the road. Um, at the very beginning of training, you'll see the model is not very good. Here on the left, you have the real frame. On the right-hand side, you have the one-step prediction of that same model. And you see it's getting things right, but there's actually a lot of garbling in that frame, right? And now this is just a one-step prediction, which means if we now were trying to make a second prediction based on the first one, already the model would be completely lost. Okay. But you see, this model just got started, and it's learning, and now already it's making fewer and fewer mistakes. Um, and I think we'll see it... This is after a little while, after 100,000 100, frames. And you can see that it's already qualitatively way better than it was before. So just to emphasize that the kind of scales we're talking about now, if you think about the DQN result that we had two years ago, we were using 200 million frames. So in, the, in that scope of things, 100,000 100, frames is, is peanuts. It's um, 15 minutes, right? And this is after training the model to, I think, for a million frames in this case. And you can tell that the, the model is actually quite good. It's predicting where the chicken's going to go. It's predicting where the cars are going to go. There's a few mistakes once in a while, but mostly it's doing fine, okay? 
so we're actually very we're very happy with this result um, and this this led to the paper but we found out something very funny which is this model works great for a one-step prediction but what happens if we actually try to chain these predictions into looking far into the future right so we call this a rollout uh, let's now look here at a 200 step rollout we're going to press the up key which makes the chicken move up and we're going to ask the question where's the chicken going to be in 200 steps and so look at this i'll play it probably twice because it's very short and there you go so it's purely imagined by the model right so what you'll notice now is something very strange is happening the cars aren't coming back and the chickens are kind of isn't coming back either right and so the very last frame of that rollout is actually there's nothing left on the screen um, so let's 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 just play this over again you'll, you'll notice the chicken gets to the top and it just vanishes and the score doesn't go up either so this model learned really good local consistencies but it just isn't getting the the long-term dependencies right uh, so so that's roughly the state of where we left this paper i just want to show you very briefly you can do better than this simple bayesian model averaging i showed you one thing you could say is well i know i know that uh, that the resolution I need is going to change over time. So I can use one of these techniques called switching um, to adaptively change my resolution. And if you do this, then what you'll see is now we have this sort of trail uh, where the ball is and where the paddles is. The resolution is becoming very narrow. And once the ball leaves that area, then the resolution returns to where it was before. Um, and that was actually a really cool result. And we also used this. Now, the problem with this approach is that the resolution changes after the fact. So after the ball has gone through where we would have needed that fine resolution, that's when the model says, oh, shoot, I should have used a smaller resolution here. But by that time, the ball is gone. and It doesn't matter anymore. So one thing we did is we actually said, can we look at the image and decide ahead of time which resolution we should use? And if you do this, then you end up with this model, which looks far better. It's basically saying, where the ball is, I'm going to use fine resolution. And where the paddles are, I'm going to use that fine resolution. Anywhere else, it's fine. I can just use big patches. So that model we actually didn't play with very much. But that, I can tell you this model would be maybe 40 or 50,000 frames a second because it's basically having to make only 20 predictions per frame, right? Um, or maybe, maybe 100. All right. So this was quite a cool result. This was already three years ago. A lot of water has gone on the bridges since then. This is actually work that we've done this year. We'll be presenting in December. Uh, and this is on the topic of exploring. So I've talked about learning a model, and I've talked about a learning a description of the state. Um, but one of the biggest problems in reinforcement learning is even saying, how do I get started? Which actions should I choose to even collect the data that would lead me to understand this domain? Okay. And so this is probably the most infamous game in, 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 in the Atari suite. It's called Montezuma's Revenge. And it's infamous because whatever you do, you're likely to fall off and break a leg. Um, and so this is me playing here, just showing, just showing you roughly what's difficult about this game. The skull is out to get you as well. Uh, and your goal, this is the starting room, and your goal is to go pick up the key in the top left, and then, and then leave, and eventually make your way out of the pyramid. Okay. So just to show you what happens, we're going to go and open the door, and here's a new room. And again, the blue, the blue barriers are going to hurt you. Okay. So exploration is basically about reducing the uncertainty. Saying, if I start in this starting room, and I go left, and I know what's going to happen, okay, that's fine. What if I go right, and I don't know what's going to happen? Exploration is about trying to take the actions that are going to lead you to understand your world. Okay. And so just to look at Montezuma's as Revenge, why this is a hard game, remember the game is operating at 60 frames per second. And now what we're asking of the agent is to go explore this whole pyramid, there's 24 rooms, this whole pyramid, uh, and navigate through it to find where the rewards are. Okay. So the basic question we were asking in this paper is saying, how can, how can we quantify how often I've been somewhere? That if we could get a handle on this, then we could do exploration. And the reason for this is because we know from theory, uh, that we can actually take the Bellman equation, right, this, this, this Q value equation, and we can add a reward bonus based on how uncertain we are about the state. And basically, that bonus can be just the inverse of the square root of the number of visits to a state. 
And if we do this with the right constant, then we can guarantee optimal exploration. So we can guarantee that wherever the reward is, we're going to eventually find it. But now the problem is that if you think about Atari, we don't really have a count. That count is always going to be zero before we come to a place. We've never been exactly in this same state. And so as a result, what most people have done in the past is they use what's called epsilon greedy, where they just choose an action, uh, epsilon fraction of the time, choose an action at random. And that's, in many ways, the state of the art in RL, which is a bit dismal, right? We explore our world by um, moving the joystick at random. So what we looked at is instead saying, well, let's not, let's not give up on this idea of counts, but instead let's try to come up with a model a density model which is going to assign a probability to each state. So what is the probability of a frame? That's something we can actually do really well. Okay, let's assign a probability to a frame and now let's say suppose we were to train this model on the same frame a second time. That probability would change. It would actually go up. Okay. So we have a starting probability, P of SA, and we have a after probability, P prime of SA. And we're going to come up with a system of two equations where we relate the uh, ratio uh, of these, we're going to call them pseudo counts, to actually, there's a hat missing here, there should be the ratio of pseudo counts to the ratio of total pseudo counts. And we're going to say the probability we're assigning to a frame is this ratio. Now, I want to emphasize that these two numbers are made up, but it turns out that in many cases, they're going to be the real numbers. They're going to still correspond to something real. But I'm making this of these two equations right now, just saying this is, what if we did this? Well, if you do this, we can now solve the system of two equations. We have two unknowns, two equations. And we can now assign a number to this frame and say, I've been to this state 3.7 times. And that's the kind of answer we get. Okay. So coming back to the model from the previous section, what we did is we took a patch level model and we asked that model, remember that model actually makes a probabilistic prediction about the frame, so we can actually ask it to do this. Uh, so we asked it to make a prediction about the whole frame, saying basically, on the grand scale of things, you've been trained in a lot of things, what's the probability you would assign to this frame? Okay. So we downsample, we do some bit of pre-processing, but roughly it's the same frame. We just feed it those pre-processed -pre pixels. Uh, and then what's really cool is if you plot the count that you get out, and that count actually sort of matches the real count. Uh, this is, again, looking at freeway, what we did is we compared the pseudo count at the bottom of the screen and a pseudo count at the top. Okay? And we had this policy where for a while we were stationary, we weren't going up, then we went up for a while, that's the green region over here, then we, went, we stayed stationary again, then we went up again. And if you look at this, then you can see that on average, this is actually averaged over, over time, on average these pseudo counts are going up, uh, which is what we would like to do, so it's saying, I've been here more often. All right. Uh, one other thing you can see is that actually they're roughly zero when you haven't been up. So before you ever go up, the model is correctly saying, I've never been here before. This is a completely novel situation. And that's what we care about for exploration, right? knowing what's novel. All right, so what we did is very simple. We took that same algorithm that adds a bonus uh, to the Bellman equation, and we add our own square root pseudo count to that equation. And if we do this, uh, lo and behold, and we just feed this bonus into the usual DQN architecture, then we go from visiting two rooms to visiting 15. Uh, so this was actually a huge success because it was, up to this point, the best algorithms were visiting about up to two rooms and they were getting at most 100 points. And so we actually got 6,600 points on, on some of the best trials. Let me actually show you what the agent, this is the agent playing now. Uh, and when I was showing this to some people, uh, some people even said, oh, I didn't even know that room existed because most people don't play the game that long. Uh, so the agent is, picks up the key, opens up the door. Um, now, if you remember, this is all from pixels, right? So the agent actually had to go and explore all of this space. It's still a bit, it's still a bit jittery, but... Uh, and now it, it's, it's, it's trying really hard to get through. This is unforgiving, right? This game is unforgiving. There you go. And it's funny that for some of these games, some actions are equivalent, for example, jumping. So it's happy to jump and not jump. Um, 
let me come back for a second to just, so normally when you play this game, what you would do is you would pick up the torch and the torch will light up this room. But of course, robots don't need light. And so this agent is, is just very happy to walk into this room and then it goes to the right hand room and there's actually three gems it can collect here and it knows about these gems. And it picks them up and you see the score change and now it knows it's picked up the gems because the score has changed. So now it can leave the room and it leaves the room. And that's roughly where the agent ends up. Uh, but again, this is the room that nobody had seen before. Um, so this was a huge success. We're very happy about this. Uh, and if you look, basically the graph says it all. In red here at the bottom is the performance of the regular DQN agent. Um, and in green is, is sort of the average performance with the, in this case, min and max. Okay. Uh, so I, I just want to conclude on this note because I think I'm running out of time now. Um, but I think basically the way to think about RL is, is to think about RL is about discovering optimal policies. Um, but the picture isn't as simple or as mathematical maybe as I made it sound in the first half. Um, and to sort of get to RL, we need to answer all these research questions like, where's the model coming from? Uh, where's the state coming from? How can I even get the data that lets me address these other questions? And that's why RL is so cool. So I think, I think there's a lot of potential in RL, whether it's looking at games, which you know end up being more real than anything else in the end when we do research, or, or actual serious applications. Uh, there's a lot of opportunities for research in both fields, um, and I think it's a fantastic time to be working in RL. So on this note, uh, I'll conclude here. A brief thank you to all of my uh, collaborators, and of course to you for listening. So thank you. That's a very good question. Um, well, I can, speak, I can speak for myself for what my opinion is about these things. Uh, we have an apply group that actually looks at applying machine learning techniques to, uh, to all kinds of real problems, right? Uh, we're collaborating inside Google. We're collaborating outside Google as well. Um, my job is more on the fundamental front. So I actually work with not just with video games, but other um, research domains, but I'm not involved in the application of these ideas directly. So is DeepMind is just a theoretical group or a purely theoretical group? No, no. So there are, there are people doing applied research inside DeepMind. Uh, there's, there's a good portion of DeepMind doing applied research. Yes? Do people kind of consider that it, the kind of Markovian approach out of math convenience that they don't consider the past? Or is it... That's, that's a good question. Um, People do consider the past, and in the recent years, people have been using uh, these neural networks called uh, LSTMs or recurrent neural networks to try to address this question. So there's actually a, um, there's actually a formalism inside reinforcement learning called the partial, obs partially observable uh, Markov process, which is actually looking at the history instead of just the Markov state. In practice, as soon as things are no longer Markov, it gets a lot harder to learn. It gets harder to define the state. Uh, it, it gets f much harder to even just discover the state. And the reason for this is that now, in the Markov case, you have to do what's called a credit assignment problem, which is to decide which action led to the reward. Now you have to ask the question, which state was I in when I received this reward? And that, that turns out to be a really complicated problem. But I think that's one of the questions that really need to be addressed for the field to move forward. Right, so actually, that's interesting because the way, the way it's defined inside the RQ learning environment is the environment gives you the reward. So it, the, the agent plays no part in deciding what that reward is. And actually, the way this works is we read the score from the memory, and we, the reward is the score differential. And as part of my PhD, I actually had to go through 60 games and, and code up this reward differential for all of them. 
Um, now, in that last uh, section I was talking about, one way to think about what we were doing is as a form of intrinsic motivation. Where we're adding this reward bonus strictly based on what the agent hasn't seen before. So this sort of novelty or curiosity bonus. And there, there there's no external reward involved, right? So the reason why we're doing better is because we're in a situation where there's very, very little reward for the agent to maximize. And so we're, we're, we're replacing this rare reward by our own intrinsic reward that's actually dense again, that says the agent now wants to go near the key. It doesn't need to get to the key, it just can get near the key, and then it gets excited about being near the key, and then it gets the key. Right? And it gets excited about near being near the door and then opening the door. Um, and that's what lets us make progress. Yes? Right, so part of the answer is that um, some of the modern algorithms like deep networks are very good at ignoring that noise. They basically just average it out. Uh, but if you had a learning algorithm which depended strongly on, uh, on exact frames, then you would run into that problem quite a bit. Uh, but if you use statistical methods, then these methods should just basically learn to ignore the noise. And it's the same thing, for example, when we compute those uh, pseudo counts. Uh, we're actually, the form that we're using is looking at a change in probability exactly because these events that are white noise, they are random, but they never, we can learn that they're random very quickly and then ignore the fact that they're random, if that makes sense. Yes. I'm, I'm being told that I should, one more question, two more? How many questions do I have? We have to stop at some point soon. Okay, one more question. Yeah. And was it the very back? Um, so if you compare games that you have multiple objectives, let's say Mario, you want to finish a game as soon as possible, but you want to try to get as many coins as you can before you can get to the next So normally, uh, that's a very good question. Normally, we um, we just define the optimality to be maximize the rewards. If that means not ending the game, then you don't end the game. So for example, a game like Space Invaders, the agent will play forever as long as it's getting reward. It doesn't care about ending the game. This was a quick question. We can have one more, right? Is there any value actually in training or pre-training in one game and fine-tuning in the other? So far, nobody has shown that that's the case. It seems like it should be true. As humans, uh, if you play a lot of video games, you're better at the next video game. And we haven't been able to see this. That's, a, that's something that somebody should look into. But uh, we haven't, the methods don't do that, basically. Okay, maybe now we should really end. Thank you very much.